I was just like in shock. I was like... Dogs need to be under control. The wrong place at the wrong time. Right now at 11, we're hearing from a young girl and her father who was brutally attacked by a dog on school grounds. We'll tell you why neighbors say this isn't the first time this has happened. <laughs> and later, we're following up with Attila the alligator, the Springfield reptile who's now residing in Corvallis. Hear how he's doing coming up. Second round of moisture set to arrive for Thursday. We'll break down how long it's going to last as KZ got 9 News at 11. Starts right now. Live, local, late breaking. This is KZI 9 News at 11. Tonight, a young girl's family is searching for answers after she was bit by a dog on local school property. The dog's owner is still nowhere to be found. We thank you for staying up late with us tonight. I'm Ariel Yakabazi. Now, Chloe Bartram went home from the hospital last night with the stitches and a staple in her face and a, uh, after a dog attacked her on Tuesday evening when she was with a friend walking across the Elmira Elementary School campus. That's when a dog escaped from its harness and ran to her. So I got like bit and then they like pulled the dog and then held it so that it wouldn't like keep attacking me, I guess. Luckily, her friend was big enough to hold the dog back. He tells us when the dog was pulled off of her, the owner put a muzzle on it and walked away. We're also told by parents this isn't even the first time this dog has acted out near the school. We were um, in communication with the school and they said that that lady has already been warned not to have her dog around the school. We reach out to the school today and officials tell us they aren't commenting on this particular incident right now, but what they could tell us was dogs are not allowed on campus. Jason Bartram, Chloe's dad, tells us a police report has been filed and they just want some answers. And a teacher at Marshfield High School is facing sex abuse charges accused of sexually abusing a student. According to the school's website, 45 year old Jeremy Berger is a math teacher. Coos Bay police say they started investigating Berger last Wednesday. The district removed him from campus and put him on administrative leave. Today, police arrested Berger on five counts of second degree sex abuse, official misconduct and luring a minor. The Coos Bay School District says while they cannot comment on the situation, their first goal is to keep students safe and they have no tolerance for behavior that endangers young people. And a Myrtle Creek man is facing a rape and sex abuse charges accused of sexually abusing two kids. This comes 10 years after he faced similar charges. 36 year old Jeffrey McCamus is being held on $2 million bail. According to court documents, an adult recognized the signs of abuse in one of the kids because she says she had been abused by him for years when they were children. McCamus faced similar charges back in 2013 and 2014, but both cases were dismissed, reportedly because he got a tattoo on a body part after the alleged abuse, and the victim inaccurately described his body part. McCamus will be back in court on Tuesday. And another man is in jail tonight, accused of throwing a gallon-sized can of tar at a woman's head during an argument last month. The Lane County Sheriff's deputies say 45-year-old Daniel Moore assaulted the woman on January 20th in the 77,000 block of Highway 99 in Cottage Grove. But when they arrived to investigate, he was nowhere to be found. Now, they finally found him on Saturday, and he's facing a charge of fourth-degree assault. And developing news out of Kansas City, Missouri tonight, where a deadly mass shooting at the Kansas City Super Bowl parade is under investigation. Kansas City police confirm more than 20 people were injured during the shooting, among them children. One person has been killed so far. ABC's Melissa Adon has the details from Los Angeles. A day of celebration turned into a mass tragedy in Kansas City after a deadly shooting near the end of the Kansas City Chiefs victory rally Wednesday. Kansas City police confirming more than 20 people were struck by gunfire, one person killed. The victim identified as Lisa Lopez Galvan, a DJ at a local radio station. The sound of the gunshots captured on video. Three people now detained by Kansas City Police. There are a lot more people who are going to be forever impacted by, by what happened here today. It was a happy celebration until the very end. The chaos erupting after Kansas City Chiefs had exited the stage in front of Union Station. 
Thousands of fans were still celebrating when the chaos unfolded. ABC's Alex Perez speaking with fans who say they took cover when they heard the gunshots. All of a sudden it sounded like fireworks and we're like, oh, okay. And then my daughter yelled, get down, get down. So she grabbed me and pulled me down. Kansas City police evacuating people out of the parking garage area as fast as possible, allowing for first responders to treat the victims. We became part of a statistic of too many Americans. Those who have experienced or been part of or connected to a mass shooting. That is something that I hope we all recognize is highly problematic for all of us. According to the Gun Violence Archive, at least 48 mass shootings have occurred in America this year. Melissa Adon, ABC News, Los Angeles. Back here at home, former clients of Dr. Matthew Byrne are speaking out tonight after they say they didn't get any notice the clinic was even shutting down. Many of these clients already prepaid thousands of dollars in procedures they didn't end up getting. The doctor who worked for Pacific Northwest Implant Studio is now a teacher at Lane Community College in Eugene. LCC officials say they didn't know about Dr. Burns' alleged involvement in the sudden closing of the clinic. Dennis Gillette uh, couldn't believe it when he found out his former dentist, Dr. Byrne, is now working with LCC. Gillette wants something to be done because his dental work is uh, not complete and he's, not only, he's missing not only thousands of dollars but also his patient records. I'm going to need those records to take to some dentist. And so she g gave me an email address to get my re my records, and I did it that same day, and I've not heard diddly squat or got anything in the mail or anything. He hopes others come forward in regards to this situation. Now, your Storm Tracker 9 first alert forecast with meteorologist Holden LaCroix. Strong area of low pressure offshore, kind of with a plume of moisture, what we call an atmospheric river has been bringing heavy rain today. We had somewhat of a break this afternoon, but towards the overnight hours, rain is starting to pick right back up again, and that is expected over the next 24 hours. Again, round two really throughout the day on Thursday, the heaviest, heaviest of which is going to be set towards tomorrow evening. But the big story is we could get about an inch of rain in Thursday alone just here in Eugene and up into the Cascades. That does translate to heavy wet snow blizzard conditions expected throughout much of the day on Friday. So uh, excuse me, Thursday. So even if you have those high profile vehicles and all terrain tires, it's still going to be treacherous conditions. Travel is not recommended over the next few days. Again, Friday is probably the best day if you want to head out towards Central Oregon. But again, we get the storm system tomorrow and again we get a very similar one on Saturday that is going to result in that heavy wet snow up across the Cascade. So all in all heavy rain starting to move back in that will set up shop once again as you can see toward tomorrow evening heavy valley rain heavy Cascade snow and that will eventually lead to some calmer conditions for Friday but Ariel it is not going to last for long. We're expecting some more heavier precipitation to move back in for Saturday. We'll break it all down in that main forecast coming up. Well, it's been about a month now since that severe ice storm hit, but tonight some CenturyLink customers are still feeling the effects. Those customers include Con Connie Siemens. She says she's having to find ways to get basic tasks done that she can't do from home right now, like going to work, uh, going to town to get her work done, or borrowing someone else's internet. Now she says she might not even be able to pay important bills. She and her partner have a business of clearing land, and with all the debris from the recent ice storm, this would be a good time for possible jobs, but not having any internet service has prevented that from being the case. I'm losing more money than I'm able to bring in. Um, luckily, <laughs> as unluckily as it may be, uh, my pickup was wrecked, and I have money from it being totaled, which is the way I'm gonna buy my laptop, and I had plans for that money um, to fix my house up that's in town. Wednesday afternoon, a CenturyLink spokesperson said an unrelated contractor doing work in the area damaged their fiber line, causing outages, and said technicians were on site Wednesday and probably Thursday as well. Well, the odd story about a Springfield alligator continues tonight. The large reptile has now been relocated to a facility in Corvallis. The animals staying at Brad's World Reptiles in Corvallis come in all shapes and sizes. They're warm-blooded or cold-blooded, 
and they're from across the country and even right here in Springfield. And that includes Attila the pet alligator. There he is right there, discovered at a Springfield mm -hmm. family's home. Brad's organization has become a new home for these exotic creatures that are rescued oftentimes from unprepared owners. People just need to think about how big an animal gets and if they're willing to keep it for its whole life. And that's a, uh, a, a critical question people should ask before they get an exotic animal. Now, the good news for Attila, he'll be able to live out the rest of his days here among other scaly friends. Well, pro basketball may not be as hard to get to anymore. They may not be the Portland Trailblazers, but the Emerald City Jaguars are a new pro team right here in Eugene. New here at 11 Sports Director Cameron Derby is here in the studio to tell us who they are and how they hope to be positive in the community. Cam. Yeah, absolutely. The Emerald City Jaguars are a new addition to the basketball league. It sounds simple, but it's competitive. And yes, it is a pro team. The players are getting paid and they're here from all over the world. They'll even have help from NBA champion and former Boston Celtic Glenn Big Baby Davis. Seriously, he's an associate head coach. The Jags let me visit their first ever training camp and I found out there's a lot more to this than making money and playing basketball. We've accepted you guys as our fans and our community. We want you guys to accept us as your hometown team. There's a brand new pro basketball team in the Western Oregon area, the Emerald City Jaguars, a new expansion of the Basketball League, or TBL. The roster is almost a melting pot of basketball minds, and the players come from all over the world. I played pro in Portugal for a whole year. Where are you from? Lansing, Michigan. Uh, so I played in Canada. I'm from Canada, and uh, I played college there. And I played overseas in Thailand, Vietnam, and Spain. We got a kid from Panama, right? Now we can keep him close, a little bit closer to home and him going super far somewhere overseas. We got guys from the West. We got guys from the East Coast. They don't have to go over those, those waters, and now they can stay here and still make a living for their families. But you may notice some familiar faces if you check out a game, like Jesse Hubie. I'm from Eugene. I was born in Bend, across the mountain. And uh, then I, I mean, we moved here when I was three, so I grew up here my whole rest of my life. I went to Sheldon High School. I graduated in 05. I'm one of the older guys, <laughs> a lot older. And then I went to Marist High School, played wow. there. And then I uh, went to Northwest Christian, what's now Bushnell University, and played four years for Luke Jackson and uh, the new head coach, Eddie Alexander. All of these basketball minds are meeting each other at the Jags first training camp at the Bob Kiefer Center in Springfield. And while the atmosphere of camp is competitive, the mindset of creating roots within the community is strong. And so the biggest thing is, like I said, we want, we want to help out the younger generation and teach them kind of what it looks like to be a pro. You know, the Eugene hasn't had that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that we could bring new to Eugene that, you know, the kids haven't seen before. Games will start for the Jags in March, but they say they're ready to start role modeling for kids in the area right now. So it, it, it's not that if you close out of a D1 opportunity, that it's over for you, you can continue to grind, continue to work hard, and you know, you never know, you could end up somewhere in the TBO. We're all hungry, we're all trying to get paid, we're all trying to put ourselves in a better position. And as long as you compete, like these guys are still still really good individuals like in this league, in the TBO. So um, it's, it's an honor and it's a blessing to be a part of this league. So uh, I, I would look at it as just like motivation, motivation that they can do it too. The Jags open their season on March 1st. However, they do have a free scrimmage you can take the kids to on Friday night. It's at 7 o'clock at Lane Community College, completely free. And by the way, they tell me kids 12 and under will get into every game this season for free. We'll check in with them through the season. For right now, live in studio, Cameron Derby, KEZI 9 Sports.